capital-based macroeconomics. I've used that term uh, for a number of years. And it's, it's begun to soak in, and other people are using it too. That it doesn't, doesn't come from a particular country. Well, of course it did, with Menger and all that. But uh, it, it, it certainly applies to many more uh, economies than the Austrian economy. <laughs> and that's why I put it that way. Now, what we're going to do today is look at the difference between sustainable and unsustainable growth. Uh, this is adapted from my book, uh, Time and Money. Start with the elements of this story and uh, start with the production possibilities frontier, which most Austrians don't like to use that. And uh, in fact, it's not very usable by itself, but with some of the other graphics, uh, it works very well. Loanable funds market, and that's a market that we have, that we think of in the widest possible sense. I know Murray Rothbard uh, in Man, Economy, and State uh, doesn't much like the loanable funds market, the graph of the loanable funds market, but he looks at it in a, in a very narrow sense. So I think I can get away very easily with using it, but in a very broad sense. Uh, the structure of production, uh, that's what you saw in the first lecture that I gave, uh, which is one of the more unique parts of the Austrian theory, uh, and therefore I did it as a separate thing, just to, just to show you that that's what's going on in this uh, theory. And labor markets, well, but this time stage-specific labor markets, which uh, is differentiated from the normal neoclassical view. And uh, I won't save my message to the end, but I'll just, I'll just show you right here that what we're looking at is sustainable growth, which has to be founded by savings. And on the other hand, unsustainable growth, which is triggered by credit creation. So that's the, that's the, a distinction that we're going to look at all through this show. Uh, a methodological point, and this is paraphrased from Hayek. He says, before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. All right? Now, in business cycle theory, uh, that little maxim is, is usually flouted, uh, especially in Keynes who seems to think it never goes right. So there's no way of showing how it might. Uh, and what you'll see in this uh, PowerPoint is that even though it's about business cycles, that's a whole shtick here, uh, but it turns out that we probably will use about two thirds uh, of the lecture showing how markets work right. And once you show how they work right, then you're in a good position to show how they can go wrong uh, with Federal Reserve policy, for instance. Okay, so capital-based macro features consumption and investment as alternative uses of the economy's resources. Uh, and here what should strike you is that this is, this is very different from the Keynesians because Keynesians add them together, C plus I plus G. And here we're putting C and I on opposite, at opposite levels there, so consumption and investment. So under favorable conditions, a fully employed market economy allocates resources to both uses, making the most out of the trade-off. And when I say favorable conditions, I mean the market is allowed to work. Okay, so we're on the production possibilities frontier shown like so. Okay, so the PPF is often used for emphasizing the concept of scarcity uh, as illustrating the implied trade-off and the uh, expositing theories of capital and, of, and interest, economic growth, and international trade. But the PPF is 
rarely appears in macroeconomic construction. This show, though, gives, gives heavy weight to the possibilities frontier. So investment here represents gross investment, which includes replacement capital. And we show you here, there's gross investment. And replacement capital is a pretty good part of uh, gross investment, but not all of it, uh, which leaves room for net investment, okay? And net investment is what allows the economy to grow. So with positive net investment, the economy grows. The PPF shifts outward from year to year, permitting increased levels of both consumption and investment. Now here, what you see with the graphs is that if you're looking at one PPF, then yes, consumption and investment are alternative ways of using resources. But over time, from period to period, if the uh, PPF shifts outward, then you have consumption and investment moving together, okay? So this investment-based outward shifting of the PPF represents sustainable economic growth based on savings, okay? Watch the economy grow. Okay, so poor, four periods of growth are shown with consumption as well as savings and investment increasing each period. The actual rate of expansion of the PPF depends upon many factors. And first and foremost, a change in the savings preferences, which provokes a movement along the initial PPF, affects the rate at which the PPF expands outward, okay? So we should be able to see this. Suppose people become more thrifty, more future-oriented. They reduce the current consumption and save instead. So if that happens, then we're moving along the PPF. Got, a little, got something going on there. Okay, with the increased saving and investment, the economy grows at a faster rate. We'll see if that works. Watch the economy grow. <laughs> okay, it's doing its, it's doing its job. <laughs> okay, it's the increased saving that makes the difference. So you see, when you have growth, then, then sure enough, investment and consumption are moving together. It's just when you ha when you're on a given PPF that. C and I move opposite directions of one another. Okay, so let's compare the high growth economy with the original low economic growth. We can do that. With no initial increase in saving, the economy grows at a modest rate. You can watch the arrow there on the left. And with the initial increase in saving, investment increases at the expense of consumption, after which both consumption and investment increase dramatically from period to period. What's the right side, okay? And if you look across there, you can think, you see now that, okay, the economy is outperforming uh, what it used to be before you had the increase in saving. Now let's look at loanable funds market. The loanable funds market was a staple in pre-Keynesian macroeconomics. Uh, and here we're just plotting the interest rate against saving and investment. And it goes like this. Saving constitutes the supply of loanable funds. There the supply curve is. And demand reflects the business community's willingness to borrow and undertake investment projects. Like so, okay? So with the interest rate serving as a price, loanable funds theory is a straightforward application of the Marshallian supply and demand analysis. So if the market is working, then we get an equilibrium point uh, which equates savings with demand for investment. 
So loanable funds theory was closely identified by Dennis Robertson, a contemporary of Keynes and a critic of Keynes's alternative theory, which was the liquidity preference theory of interest. So this is just my little plug to Dennis Robertson. I liked him. Okay. On the suggestion of Roy Herod, who was a sympathetic expositor of the Keynesian system, Keynes included in his general theory, page 180, uh, a graph rendering of the loanable funds market. And now it turns out that Keynes did put it in, but only to emphasize that he was throwing it out. Okay, he didn't like that loanable funds theory. And we'll see why uh, as we go along. If people become more future oriented, they increase their saving, causing the interest rate to fall and thereby encouraging the business community to undertake more investment projects. So watch the saving curve shift rightward. Increase in saving. There it is. With given technology, the Equality of saving and investment is prerequisite to genuine, sustainable economic growth. It's saving that finance the investment. The loanable funds market and the PPF tell mutually enforcing, reinforcing stories. So we just look at these two graphs together. Like so. Now you have to look at both graphs at once. Okay, notable funds market shows how the interest rate brings saving and investment into line with one another. The PPF shows how the trade-off is struck between consumption and investment. And the market adjustments in output prices and wages and other input prices keep the economy functioning on the PPF. So there's a assumption here at this point that the market is working and the prices change if they need to change, so wages and so on. So these two elements of capital-based macroeconomics show the pattern of movements in consumption, saving and investment, and the interest rate that are consistent with the change in intertemporal preferences, that is, with saving. So as before, we let people become more future-oriented uh, they save more, which transmits a signal, a lower interest rate, to the business community. So watch the saving-induced increase in the interest rate and the corresponding movements along the PPF. Here we go. All right. So we've, we've, got, we've got the thing working right, right? The lower rate of interest establishes a new equilibrium in the loanable funds market, and the economy moves along the PPF in the direction of more investment and less current consumption. Now, most other macroeconomists will just balk at that, that, that somehow you're, you're getting less consumption but more investment. Uh, and we'll show you why, because Keynes looked at it the other way. Uh, but it turns out that uh, at lower interest rates, then lots of uh, investment projects become affordable and uh, investors are, are eager to, to use those resources, uh, which will give output in future uh, years or future months, whatever it is. Even the possibility of a market economy could work in this way is at odds with Keynesian theory. And you get, this, you get the flavor of Keynesianism here. Note that more investment is undertaking as consumption falls. That's, that's the Austrian view, okay? And you can see that on the graphs. But according to Keynes, any reduction in consumer spending would result in excess inventories, which in turn would cause production cutbacks, worker layoffs, a spiraling down of, of income and expenditures. The economy would go into recession, 
and the business community would commit itself to less, not more, investment. That's Keynes' paradox of thrift. So in other words, uh, from that PPF, Keynes sees that the that the market is just going inside the PPF. It's, it's, it's going with less consumption and less uh, investment. So you get a depression right there for Keynes. Now the key is about the retail inventories. They're, rep they're representative investments according to Keynes. If retail investors, retail inventories, were a representative investment, then Keynes would be right. Here, the drive demand effect dominates. Reducing the consumer spending means reduced inventory replacement. In general, late stage investments move with consumer spending. That's what Keynes would say. However, the interest rate effect dominates in the long term or interest stage investments. Uh, a lower interest rate can stimulate industrial construction for instance, or product development. So you get that trade-off, okay? So to keep track of the changes in the general pattern of investment activity, we need to consider the structure of production and the stage-specific labor market. And that's what we looked at uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the structure of production. And it's so unique of the Hayekian theory, the Austrian theory, that uh, I had a separate take on that a couple of days ago. Okay, so capital-based macroeconomics disintegrates capital intertemporally. Consumable output is produced by a sequence of stages of production, the output of one stage feeding in as input to the next. The temporal, temporally defined stages are arranged graphically from left to right in the output of the final stage constituting consumable output, all right? So an early stage process would be something like product development, looks like that's going on there. And the late stage would be inventory management. The guy needs some customers actually, but there they are, okay? So late stage investment activity is exemplified by inventory management. For pedagogical convenience, the initial capital structure is shown as having five stages. Of course, there are lots of stages in a market economy, but we're making do with five here. With growth, though, the number of stages can increase. Although all five of these stages are in operation during each time period, resources can be tracked through the structure of production over time. And we'll see if we can do that. Together, the sequence of stages form the Hayekian Triangle, a summary depiction of the economy's intertemporal structure of production. In a growing economy, the triangle increases in size along with the outward expansion of the production possibilities frontier. Now we'll see, let's watch this. And now we're gonna link up those two graphs. So watch the PPF and the structure of production expand together. Okay, so that's just uh, ongoing growth. Uh, no change in the saving preferences, but people are saving all along, and that gives you ongoing growth. So when people choose to save more, they send two seemingly conflicting signals to the market. And they're seemingly conflict conflictive because people are thinking in terms of Keynesian terms. So decreased consumption dampens the demand for the investment goods that are in close proximity with the consumable output. This is the derived demand effect. In other words, if they're saving more, they're not spending as much on consumer goods. And so inventories drop. People quit holding so much inventories because people aren't consuming that much. But a reduced interest rates, which means that lower 
uh, borrowing costs stimulates demand for investment goods that are temporarily remote from the consumable output. This is the time discount or interest rate effect. Drive demand and time discount are in conflict only if investment is conceived as a simple aggregate, as it is in Keynes' C plus I plus G. So investment, no matter whether it's consumption or, in, or early stage, uh, is, uh, is considered investment. Okay. In capital-based macro, capital and hence investment is conceived as a structure. So changes in the demand for investment then can add differentially to or subtract differentially from the several stages of production that make up the structure. Keynes theorizing in terms of aggregates rather than in terms of structure underlies Karen, uh, Hayek's claim that Mr. Keynes aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. And that, that was a, a, that's what Hayek needed to say at that point. That was the problem. Increased saving results in an allocation of resources among the stages of production. The two effects, derived demand and time discount, have their separate and complementary effects on the capital structure. Let's watch that. And here, just for emphasis, let me, let me say this slightly differently, that a decreased demand for consumption goods dampens investment activities in the late stages of production. That would be inventory replacement. That would be dampened, uh, reducing the height of the Hayekian triangle. And with time discount, the reduced rate of interest stimulates investment activities in the early stages of production increasing the base of the high kin triangle. Okay, so watch the structure of production respond to an increase in savings. Note the emergence of the sixth stage of production. Increased saving results in a reallocation of resources among the stages of production. The two effects derive demand and time discount have their separate and complementary effects on the capital structure. Okay, now we can use these two graphs together and show how it works. Increased saving then has an effect on both the magnitude and the investment aggregate and the temporal pattern of capital creation. So watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. Okay, so it didn't fall into the interior of the PPF like Keynes thought it would. It simply changed the activities from the late stage to the early stage uh, in view of the increased saving. And, and of course, those increased savings are what the people operating in the early stages are using. They're borrowing those savings uh, in order to uh, in, in order to have those early stage uh, activities. So the PPF shows that more saving permits more investment. See the arrows. The Hayekian Triangle shows that capital creation in the late stages, such as retail inventories, is decreased while the capital creation in the early stages, such as product development, is increased. So you get that kind of a twist of the structure of production. And all this is by way of showing how markets can work, okay, without being hobbled by a, a central bank. The structure of production is given a more future orientation, which is consistent with the saving that made the restructuring possible. That is, people are saving now in order to increase their future spending power. That's why they save, okay? They don't save for fun. It's not fun. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so they plan to spend it and take some entrepreneurial uh, judgment to figure out what they're going to spend it on. But that's, that's, what the, uh, par, uh, that's what the economy is all about. 
Okay. Note the increase in the growth rate. This, the sound is kind of lags what's going on, but we'll, we'll make do. Okay. So now let's look at it. First, I think we look at the PPF uh, as tracked by both the PPF and the Hayekian Triangle. Consumption is seen to fall as the economy is adapting to a higher growth rate, after which consumption rises more rapidly than before and eventually surpasses the old projected growth path. So look at the PPF. You get a, you get a little bit of a fall and then a big bounce. You get the same thing. Let me do that again. Watch the, the graph. Down and then up, okay. And now down below here, I've uh, I've got a graph that shows consumption over time, and it would look like this. And that's exaggerated, showing it goes way down. Uh, it it typically just still goes up, but at a less a lesser rate. But I want the people in the back room to be able to see it, so I'll make it go down. <laughs> All right. And then you can compare uh, the, the dashed line with the solid line and see the saving implies the giving up of some consumption in the near future. And you'll see that there. OK. Saving implies the giving up of some consumption in the near future in order to enjoy more consumption in the intermediate and far future. And that, that, there's where you see the far future is getting more, getting, getting more consumption. Okay. While most macroeconomic theories deal with the labor market and the wage rate, capital-based macro allows for state-specific labor markets. With the change in the interest rate, state-specific uh, wage rates change in a pattern rather than change uniformly. And we can see that we put some labor markets down here. Although a labor market for each stage could be depicted, the pattern of changes, Hayek's wage rate gradient. Uh, is revealed by distinguishing between the early stage and the late stage uh, labor market. So there's the early stage labor market and there's the late stage labor market. So watch the economy respond to an increase in saving, just looking at labor, labor markets. What you'll see, well, let's do it and we'll see. Let me do that once more if you didn't see it. <laughs> So what's, what's happening here is that workers are leaving the retail markets and going into the investment markets because that's what the economy responding to increased saving involves. So here we go. So one demand curve shifts left and the other one shifts right. And then we can even show what Hayek called the wage rate gradient. Uh, that, the, that there's a movement in relative wage rates, which is the very kind of market signal that causes workers to drop out of the retail business and get into the uh, investment business. Now, we've got it all together here. Uh, loanable funds market, production possibilities frontier, structure of production, stage-specific labor markets, Looks like that, okay? So now watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. And you can see it's uh, poetry in motion, I think is, would be the right word. But here, here it goes, and I'll do it a couple of times. Okay, so you don't get Keynes uh, sliding into depression, you just get market mechanisms work like market mechanisms are supposed to. 
and that's it. Uh, I'm going to show this again, if only because it took me a long time to make it look. <laughs> <laughs> So there it goes, okay. Now we're gonna shift gears totally, where we're really talking about business cycles as opposed to how the economy works. So now we're talking about policy-induced, unsustainable growth, the macroeconomics of boom and bust. And I take this from Steve Hankey because he has a much more stern look than I can muster, all right. Uh, but he did, I have to say, he did read Time and Money before he wrote this. So he wrote, with interest rates artificially low, consumers reduce savings in favor of consumption, and entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending, and then you have an imbalance between saving and investment, you have an economy on an unsustainable growth path, this, in a nutshell, is the lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 20s and 30s. So we'll see how this goes. This is from Hayek. I think I'll take time to read it because some people have claimed that in his late years, uh, he, didn't, he didn't approve of that business cycle that he'd done earlier. But here is, he's in his late years, okay? And he says, booms have always appeared with a great increase in investment, a large part of which proved to be erroneous, mistaken. That's because people weren't saving. The interest rate just went down because of the Fed. That, of course, suggests a supply of capital was made apparent which wasn't actually existing. The whole combination of a stimulus to investment on a large scale followed by a period of acute scarcity of capital because people weren't saving, is consistent with the idea that there has been a misdirection due to monetary influences. And that general scheme, I still believe, is correct. Okay, now look what we've got, credit expansion. Increasing increases in the money supply enter the economy through credit markets. The central bank literally lends money in existence. The new money masquerades as saving. That is, the supply of loanable funds entails shifts rightward, but without there being any increase in saving. Okay, so watch the opposing movements of saving and investment as the central bank adds money, delta M, to the supply side of the market for loans. No. This clues you off. This is, this is a different kind of different kind of uh, structure, there you go. So, so he increased the money supply, uh, but that didn't increase saving, it reduced saving, because saving, the interest rate is lower now, and so people save less, they're not so eager to save at, the, at that low rate of interest. Responding to a lower interest rate, people actually save less and consume more. Right, so they're consuming more. The result is not a new sustainable equilibrium, but rather a disequilibrium that for a time is masked by the infusion of loanable funds. Okay. Now, pumping new money through credit markets drives a wedge between saving and investment. And those investors move down along their demand curves, taking advantage of the lower borrowing costs. You see that arrow, okay? And savers move down along their unshifted saving curves in response to the weakened incentive to save. That is that lower interest rate. So the discrepancy between saving and investment is papered over, literally, isn't it? Papered over with newly created money, which itself represents no investable resources. And there's that arrow. So that's what's going on in the labor market. Much of Hayek's writing on money is aimed at shifting focus away from the bedrock relationship between money and general level of prices and toward the intertemporal discoordination that is caused by credit creation. Now look what happens upstairs here. Favorable credit conditions spur 
on investment activity, which suggests a clockwise movement along the PPF in the direction of investment. Like so. But income earners are actually saving less and hence consuming more, which suggests counterclockwise movements along the PPF in the direction of consumption. So what you're looking at here is some very serious disequilibrium. The wedge between saving and investment translates into a tug of war between consumers uh, and investors. Okay, noting the investment dimension of the clockwise movement and the consumption dimension of the counterclockwise movement, we see that credit expansion pushes the economy toward a point that lies beyond the PPF. The PPF is the, is the sustainable levels of consumption and investment. It can go beyond the PPF, but then it's in the unsustainable region. That's the whole point. All right, so we've got consumers pushing upward and investors uh, pushing rightward. And the result is the economy going out beyond the sustainable PPF into an unsustainable region. That's how that's working, okay? Okay, now look at production possibility, or uh, the stages of production, the triangle. The low interest rates consistent with future orientation stimulates investment activities in the early stages. So you can see that to the left there. But without sufficient resources being freed up elsewhere, many of these investment projects will never be completed. That's why you have the dotted line. It doesn't quite get completed. Compounding the intertemporal discoordination, increased consumer demand draws some resources toward the late stages, further reducing the prospects of completing the new capital structure. In other words, people are consuming more rather than saving, and you get a distorted triangle in that direction. The dynamics of boom and bust entail both overinvestment, shown in the PPF, and malinvestment, the unsustainable lengthening of the Hayekian triangle. So you get malinvestment, overinvestment. You get overconsumption, as shown in both the PPF and the, and the triangle. So Mises repeatedly used the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption to describe the business cycle. Okay. The tug of war pits the consumers against investors, pushes the economy beyond the PPF unsustainably. The low interest rate favors investment and increasingly binding resource constraints keep the economy from reaching that extra PPF. So look at that uh, PPF diagram and you can see that you're moving towards, but you don't get there, all right? Because resources are scarce, much more scarce than, than was thought. And so the temporally conflicted structure of production, dueling triangles, uh, John uh, Cochran in Birmingham uh, gave me that phrase, dueling triangles, I like it. And so the economy can fall into depression. And so if you look at that orange line, Probably no, I used orange and blue because that's Auburn colors, you know. But <laughs> you look at that orange line and you see that's the only thing that Keynes picked up on. You know, he just saw the economies falling into the interior and there it is. Okay. Now real quickly, because we're almost out of time, you got a wedge between saving and investment. You've got a tug of war between consumers and investors, all right, here we go. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over differences between saving and investment gives play to the tug of war between consumers and investors. Pitting early stage against late stage distorts the Hayekian triangle at both directions, 
the temporal coordination eventually turning boom in the bust. So watch the economy respond to credit expansion. Let's see if this works. <laughs> <It's Bernanke. laughs> and you're all too young to know who that is. Do you know who it is? Who? That's that's Joe the plumber. <laughs> the, that gave these people a hard time back in an earlier presidential election. Okay, I don't have time for the rest of this, so we'll quit right here. Thank you very much.